I want to ask you to join me in an exercise for just a moment. Some of you may have engaged in this activity before, but for some of you, it may be a new experience. Take a moment to become aware of how you feel. How are you sitting? Is there any part of your body, including your mind, that feels tense right now? Now place your feet in a comfortable position, position on the floor. If your feet or legs are crossed, uncross them. If your arms are crossed or draped on the pew, place them comfortably at your side or in your lap. Close your eyes and try to minimize any sound you may be creating. Slowly take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold it for just a moment, not to the point where it's uncomfortable, then slowly release through your mouth. Then repeat this two more times. Do this at your own pace, focusing on nothing except the act of taking a deep, life-giving breath. Physiologically, we know that there is tremendous benefit in deep breathing. These benefits include a reduction in stress and blood pressure, strengthening of the abdominal and intestinal muscles, resulting in a stronger core and an overall sense of well-being and even relief in dealing with certain types of aches and pains. Deep breathing allows for life-giving oxygen to enter and circulate through your body, dilating your blood vessels, promoting better blood flow, releasing toxins from the body, and aiding in more healthy sleep patterns. In addition, focusing on your breathing can help you become more mindful of your body and your thought process, improving your self-awareness. Now, this is not a lecture on physiology, I promise. There's a point to this. It's not just the act of breathing itself. It's the mindfulness, the awareness, the being in tune with the breathing that brings life. However, studies have shown that at times when we could most utilize this process of deep, life-giving breathing, we do the exact opposite. During times of stress, anxiety, or hopelessness, we often take shallow breaths or even stop breathing for short periods of time. As a result, during these times of stress, we actually intensify the stress. We internalize, we constrict, we wither. Even when we, do, even when we know to do this, when we know to breathe deeply, we forget. We focus more on what is taking life than what could give it. Many of you know that I work in developmental and behavioral pediatrics, as Andrew just outlined, and it's not unusual for us to see patients who deal with anxiety and anger outbursts. One of the first coping skills that we teach them is deep breathing in the hope that it can diffuse impulsivity, negative thinking, and destructive behaviors. Recently, one very honest 13-year-old boy I was working with told me, you know, I could do that, but it's just easier to dive headfirst into the anger. If we are honest with ourselves, we could probably all relate to this expression. It is very difficult to emerge from anxiety, depression, hopelessness, and despair. I sometimes catch myself forgetting to breathe, However, there was a particular incident that instilled in me the awareness of breath and self. It's no secret that my wife is my hero. Several years ago, Amy and I read Par Parker Palmer's book, Let Your Life Speak. For those of you who do not know Parker Palmer, he is a Quaker educator who has learned to embrace all parts of life, including the fulfillment that comes from reaching others and the self-awakening that occurs as we struggle through times of depression or hardship. Written to, to those who are seeking to live authentically, Parker encourages the reader to listen to life in order to understand your limits and your potentials, to embrace your frailty and your strength, to appreciate your past and your future, to live more deeply into your selfhood, by doing so, we find communion with God and with others and discover ways of serving the world's deepest needs. After we finished reading the book, Amy, who knew I had a longtime desire to pursue nursing in order to care for the world in my own unique way, came to me and said, 
I know what you're feeling, and it's time. You don't need to deny this part of yourself and look back 10 years from now with regret. So at the age of 39, I started nursing school. Now, I'm a fairly confident person, but my first day of class was a combined organic biochemistry class, specifically designed for nursing majors. And up until that day, I had gotten by without taking a single day of chemistry, not in high school, not in an undergraduate degree, not in a master's degree. I walked into the room and I suddenly realized one of these things is not like the others. As I searched for a seat amongst 40 females in their early 20s, I began to panic. And when I panic, I have that annoying breakthrough sweat that only makes you more conspicuous. I could see them look at me, some with subtlety and some with more of a wide-eyed, mouth-open gawk. And I knew exactly what they were thinking. What is this guy's story? And hey, wow, doesn't he look great for his age? <laughs> I wanted to turn around and walk out and be content. I wanted to just move on because I realized this is going to be much harder than I had anticipated. I found a seat at the back of the room near an open window. I was aware of my overwhelming anxiety and in that moment, I closed my eyes and took some deep breaths. As I did, a breeze from the open window began to surround me. Gradually, I began to hear, you're okay, <laughs> you can do this. The anxiety was replaced with peace and then with confidence. Whether that was God speaking to me directly or me hearing my inner voice, I have drawn on that experience multiple times through much, much rougher times in my life. Times when the despair has felt so great that I wanted to just give up. Reminding myself to breathe and to listen and to watch. This passage from Ezekiel is famous for its dry bones. And if you're of a certain age, you probably can't help but begin singing a song in your head about the thigh bone being connected to the hip bone and hearing the word of the Lord. And when one of our boys was younger, the valley of dry bones for him was framed by the scene from The Lion King when Simba and Nala were in the elephant graveyard surrounded by elephant skeletons. A really scary and ominous scene for a child. Reflection on this passage draws attention to the mystery and the majesty of Yahweh God, who knows no death that cannot be infused with life. And this revelation offers hope to the church whose purpose is to offer life in a culture that too often creates despair. Ezekiel's 6th century BC reality is not that different from our current one. For we, like they, are often dry bones, living in a world that is intent on oppression and death for many rather than life for all. Historians debate some of the finer points for the timeline, but it is largely assumed that Ezekiel went into a Babylonian exile with the first wave of Israelites who were deported in 597 BC, a group that was added to when Nebuchadnezzar 10 years later destroyed what remained of Jerusalem in a furious rage, capturing and blinding the king Zedekiah and hurting the last leaders of a shattered Judah eastward to the huge Babylonian capital. So when Ezekiel speaks of dry bones in a valley, he means exactly that. Dead soldiers after a slaughter, empty lives after a crashing defeat. This had to be an overwhelmingly emotional experience for Ezekiel. In preparing for the message today, I tried to imagine what Ezekiel must have felt like looking at that valley of bones knowing that they represented his people, his culture, his life. In 2001, I was in Cambodia for a work meeting with World Vision. It was my first time in the country. And while in Phnom Penh, I was amazed at the city. It has glorious architecture. It has sights and sounds and smells that bring everything to life, all the senses to life but it also has multiple victims of landmines, missing limbs who are begging. 
Our host took us on a brief tour of the area before we began our work, and as part of the tour, the young woman named Shantou took us to the killing fields. In preparation for the trip, I had read up on the history, and I had also watched the movie The Killing Fields, but I was not nearly prepared for what I experienced. The Cambodian killing fields are a number of sites in Cambodia where collectively more than a million people were killed and buried by the Khmer Rouge regime during its rule of the country from 1975 to 1979. The mass killings are widely regarded as part of a broad state-sponsored genocide. Analysis of the grave sites by research indicate at least 1.3 million victims of execution. But additional research has projected that the actual number killed was closer to 2.5 million. The Khmer Rouge regime arrested and executed those they saw as a threat. This included ethnic Vietnamese, ethnic Thai, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Cam, Cambodian Christians, Buddhist monks, any individual with suspected connection to the former government or other foreign governments, as well as all professionals and intellectuals. As we walked up to the sites, I was surprised by the fact that remains were still being uncovered. We could see where work was carefully being done, and we watched as skeletons, still with rags of clothing attached, were removed from mass graves. As we walked, we could see new remains with every step we took. I felt like I was at the scene of a horrible atrocity, but also like I was standing on incredibly sacred ground. Chantou told us her story. Both of her parents were educators who were tortured and killed by the Khmer Rouge. Her mother had created an opportunity for Chantou and her grandmother to escape, and they kept moving, hiding in rural and jungle areas for over two years until the regime was brought down. She told the story with incredible sadness, but incredible reverence as well. And then she explained how the work of uncovering the remains was done so carefully with great intentionality since each bone represented an individual. There is a glass encasement in the middle of each killing field where the bones are placed as a testimony to the many individuals who lost life due to injustice. And the motivation for the glass case is to never again accept intolerance. I think of Shantou when I read about Ezekiel. When Yahweh placed Ezekiel into this silent and terrifying valley of bones, Ezekiel must have felt the intense loss and awareness that it was not just a valley of bones. These were individual lives. God asks, can these bones live? Instead of Ezekiel responding with an incredulous, do what? He gives an ambiguous response of, oh, Yahweh, God, you know. Now, he could have been thinking, how could dry bones mean anything other than death? But I think he knew that Yahweh, in mystery and majesty, was about to do something extraordinary. God then tells Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones and say to them, thus says Yahweh. When it seems that all is lost, that there is only despair, God will provide breath and sinews and flesh and skin such that the bones will leap to life again until the valley is filled with a standing host, a vast multitude of living beings. Israel's exile to Babylon was far from being the last word by God. The dry bones of oppression, defeat, and humiliation will become the healthy host of Israel once again. There will be a future and a hope for the scattered, desperate people. Dry bones will indeed live again. I love having the individual freedom of interpreting and envisioning scripture. I have often heard this story told as Ezekiel crying out to the bones as he stood on the crest of the valley. But I like to think that Ezekiel wandered among the bones, speaking to them and then crying in a much more personal manner. 
reflecting and embracing the despair, which now points towards hope and reconciliation. The people of Israel had separated themselves from God. In essence, they had dug their graves of despair with their fear of God's absence. To this hopelessness, Ezekiel offers a simple metaphor, the ready availability of breath. In these 14 verses, the Hebrew word ruach occurs nine times. In this passage, it is variously translated as breath, as wind, as God's own spirit. Whether it appears in one instance as breath or in another as wind, it is all the same life-giving force, and it is all from God. And it is in this sense that breathing becomes a metaphor for divine presence. Despite the exile's fear of being cut off from God, God is as near to them as their own breath. Though they remain in exile, still coping with the death of loved ones, still mourning the loss of familiar ways to find and meet God, they are reassured of God's continual presence. The standing multitude of dry bones brought back to life now acquires a somewhat different connotation. Because God is present, they can breathe and stand ready for the future, looking forward in hope. Calvary, this concept of ruach has been a focus for Pastor Anne during her sabbatical. When she speaks of the practice of yoga, she beautifully describes being aware of breath, her breathing in and out, but also being aware of God's life-giving breath. As a church, we are challenged to engage in this awareness as well. Some of us feel as if we are dry bones, knowing the paralyzing despair that takes life. May we be reminded by each other that God's hope and covenant is only a breath away. But as a church, we must also hear the rattling of dry bones and know the power of God's wind. A church that dwells in the valley of dry bones, created by a culture that leaves people behind, encourages prejudice, and neglects the underserved, needs to recognize those who are oppressed by a culture of injustice and circumstances that have hidden access to life for individuals and families. And then we speak the word of prophecy. When we are asked the question, can these bones live? May our answer come not in ambiguity, but in certainty. Oh God, you know, but so do we. These bones can live. We will be about the life-giving breath of God that brings regeneration to a fuller humanity. May it be so. Amen. Once said, the glory of God is a human being 